Hey, welcome back to the Disney Plus Everyday Challenge. Today we have Nomeo and Juliet. Uh, this is an animated feature. It is from 2011. It's 10 years old. It's an hour and 26 minutes long. And uh, I did not know what to expect from this. I, I knew it existed. Uh, it It is technically a Disney film, even though it falls under the Touchstone Pictures banner, and it's distributed by Walt Disney. It's fully a Walt Disney partner thing. It's not a purchase from... didn't come along with a Fox merger or anything. Uh, it It's also produced by R Rocket Productions, and as you hear the music and everything else, and you're like, okay, it, this is from the Rocket Man himself. This is fully an Elton John production. Uh, <laughs> if you have kids and you love Elton John and you want to introduce them to the music of Elton John, show them this movie. Because every time they hear an Elton John song on the radio, assuming you ever have control of the radio with children in the car, um, they'll go, that's from Romeo and Juliet, because nearly every one of his big hits show up in some form or another in this movie. Uh, whether he's actually singing them or somebody uh, covers it, uh, or it's a duet with Lady Gaga. Uh, Nelly Furtado uh, does one of the songs with him, I think, on her own. It, there's caricatures of him there uh, throughout. Uh, <laughs> he is a humongous presence in this film, even though he technically is not in it. Um, his voice is throughout it. Uh, if you don't know what this movie is about, it's about garden gnomes and their battle uh, between two lands in on Verona Street. Yes, it's it's a it's another take on the classic Shakespeare Romeo and Juliet story if you hadn't figured that out somehow by looking at the title. Uh, but uh, when you're looking at making a children's story, uh, a comedy even, you know, just an animated one with garden gnomes, you kind of have to be careful about the subject matter because if you know anything about the story of Romeo and Juliet, obviously it's about two young teenagers who fall in love despite their family's uh, war against each other through reasons they don't even remember or even understand. Um, and they fall in love. It's a forbidden love, and it's fast and it's hot, and it goes... It, it just goes out in a burst of flames. Well, technically, uh, poison. But... Uh, they kill themselves. They kill each other because they think the other is dead. And that's a way to end a movie. That's a, a way of, a way to end a play by Shakespeare. That is, it's not a romance as much as it is, as it is a tragedy. How do you address that? And how do you stay true to to the original story? Well, you don't necessarily. It's so you're not going to have to worry about you know putting this in front of your five year old and going, hey, there's a double suicide at the end that you have to worry about. No. There's not. There's will will characters be murdered uh, in in the conflict that leads up to their discovery? No, technically no. There are garden gnomes. Uh, it's they're all made of stone or porcelain or clay or whatever it is. They're all stone-based creatures. And yes, there's a there's an actual no. It's not an actual frog. It's a plastic frog that shoots water. But they're alive, too. It's the Toy Story rule. Whenever there's humans around, which we never see the faces of any humans whatsoever in this film, but you hear their voices, um, whenever there are humans around, they have to revert to form. You know, if they're a statue, well, they, and they're posed like this, they have, to, they have to pose like that. If, you know, just like the toys, they just, they fall limp, these uh, garden gnomes and other creatures have to revert to their standard pose no matter where they are and that comes up here and there in the process of the film of course um well the, the conflict is actually created by the two neighbors a man and a woman who hate each other two old people who are just always battling it out with each other calling each other names and trying to one-up each other on the better garden and they feel that Either one or the other is sabotaging the other's garden when it's really the garden gnomes uh, sort of undermining each other's efforts, doing horrible things to each other. 
And uh, in the process of this, of course, Juliet, played by Emily Blunt, which you would might recognize from uh, the Mary Poppins Returns or the new. Uh, I can't remember the name I just saw it the other day. Uh, a Quiet Place Part Two and the original Quiet Place. Um, she, she's Juliet, and James McAvoy is Romeo. You'll know him as Professor X in uh, so many of the X-Men films and uh, just a host of other things. He was in the Glass trilogy. Uh, but yeah, it's or the, it's not called the Glass trilogy, but it's, you know, the trilogy with Samuel L. Jackson and Bruce Willis. Anyway, he, uh, the, the two of them obviously fall in love. It's actually done pretty well. It, it's, it's sweet. It's, it's wholesome. It, it, there, I mean, there is what separates us from most Disney films, uh, at least characterization-wise and storytelling-wise, is that there are a number of pop culture references, kind of like a Shrek movie, that don't fit into the world in which they're in. Uh, it's <laughs> so, like in a Disney film, you, you never see um, Merida, you know, making a. A Seinfeld joke, or there's no, there's, there's no disconnect from the world in which they're in. In this one, there's actually an American Beauty reference <laughs> uh, involving the frog, and uh, it's very, very odd. There's lots of rose petals involved. Uh, <laughs> who is one of the funnier characters in this thing? She's the sidekick to Juliet, and and uh, Rome, Romeo gets a toadstool, a mushroom. He's a mushroom, and uh, he's silent, and they're, they're, he's like a dog in a sense to, to the gnomes. Anyway, there's so much going on in this. Believe it, believe it or not, it's not something I would have told you, would have believed anybody if they said this is actually has a lot of stuff happening. A lot of there's a lot of little characters. There's lots of interesting little designs for the characters. I thought it was going to be bland and trite and just dumb and it's not it's actually funny it's actually uh entertaining e even though it's a little ham-fisted with all with literally throwing in another elton john song like every five to ten minutes any kind of moment in where their people aren't speaking and you see character development between like a montage or something of them starting to fall in love or having an adventure kind of thing you gotta throw in that Elton John song it it's I like Elton John it's it's his his songs are classics uh, Disney has had a long relationship with him going on like way back to the Lion King uh, it's nothing wrong with an Elton John song but it it very much seems like hey you know what <laughs> let's put all the songs in here license the movie it's if it's big then residuals I, I, I guess I, I don't know how that all works with when you're making your own movie with your own songs crammed into it either way it's it's actually fun it's actually sweet uh, the characters like, like the characters while there are pop culture references it's not it's not the characters themselves doing it consciously at least they're not our main characters like I said, the Frog with the American Beauty reference was a little out there and very odd, uh, but it, it worked. Uh, it, it was just strange enough to be funny. Uh, and it, it's interesting. Oh, I'm looking at little references on, on IMDb as this is as I'm talking here. Uh, the very one of the very first jokes where you just go mm, is, but in a good, good way, is the uh, addresses for the the neighbors. Uh, the woman lives in 2B, or the man lives in 2B, and the woman lives in not 2B. The circle slash over the 2B, which you imagine that was vandalism, maybe, but it wouldn't make sense to have two 2Bs. Either way, they're on Verona Street. It's, yeah, there's all sorts of stuff. And in fact, the very beginning uh, <laughs> has a very tiny gnome giving the prologue as to what is going on in this land of Verona, uh, Italy, and... And he says, hey, this story's been told a lot before. We're going to tell it again, but different. And, yeah, he gets pulled off the stage before he gets to do the whole, you know, prologue uh, leading up to this romance. But uh, it, it's, it is very conscious of what it's trying to do. And uh, I, I'm going to... 
this movie's been around for 10 years. If You're not going to be watching it for major plot points. I mean, it's all... It doesn't end the way Romeo and Juliet ends. I've already gone through this. It's They get around that. But it's not without involving William Shakespeare himself, played by Patrick Stewart, <laughs> as a statue of William Shakespeare, speaking and discussing... Um, like, hey, you know what? Your situation that you've been telling me, Nomeo, is very much like a story I wrote. And they go, well, how did how'd that end? And tells him the horrible results. And, and Nomeo's like, I'm not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Come on. So they make it very clear to the audience that, hey, yeah, this, this stuff isn't going down. Um, <laughs> there, other weird things in this are like, uh, there's an, an obsession with lawnmowers. Uh, there's a one-upsmanship in creating a perfect lawn garden as a... Uh, uh, we, have, we have backyards in America, they have gardens in England, and this very much takes place in England. Um, it's very English. And speaking of which, I have to go down the list of actors because the weirdest thing about this movie is the cast. I have... This has to have gotten... and should have gotten an award for the oddest casting for a movie or an animated movie for a movie at all in, in 2011 or in all time I don't know but it is uh, you know, okay, I already told you about James McAvoy and Emily Blunt main characters Patrick Stewart um, we throw in some um, throw in uh, Maggie Smith as the matriarch of the blues uh, the blue people of blue gnomes and Michael Caine as the patriarch of the red Headed gnomes, uh, Matt Lucas, which you you'd recognize from endless amounts of British television. If you know, if you haven't seen him, he's even been in Doctor Who. Of course, everybody's been in Doctor Who. Jim Cummings, uh, of course, has to play something in every animated film that goes through Disney. Uh, he's Winnie the Pooh. He's Tigger. Uh, he is Hondo Anaka in the Clone Wars. He is endless amounts of characters everywhere throughout Disney. He is here, he's a pink flamingo in this one named Featherstone, which is named after the guy who invented the lawn flamingo. Little trivia there. So, <laughs> adding, we also have Stephen Merchant, I already told you about Patrick Stewart, but now I'm going to get you, there's there's so many others, I have to get to the, uh, the weird, weird, weird casting. It's going to get weirder as I go along. <laughs> Jason Statham plays Ty Tybalt. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Tybalt. Jason Statham is Tybalt, who is this buff, crazy, red-headed gnome who is challenges Gnomeo in lawnmower races. I know it sounds completely stupid, but it's a thing. Uh, one of his minions is a deer, like a, like a plastic deer, like a fawn. It's called Fawn. It's voiced by Ozzy Osbourne. British. Why not? But these are, we get musical, these are a number of musical guest voices in this. Um, the girl who waves the flag uh, for the race, it's a uh, Dolly Gnome. Guess who? Performed by Dolly Parton who I think she has little boobs. <laughs> I don't recall. Um, but she, you know, it's not like overly done kind of situation. But uh, she's one of the few few Americans other than Hulk Hogan who shows up as the voiceover for a web ad uh, when one of the two humans goes shopping for a new lawnmower that got broken by the gnomes. And... Uh, Click, she clicks on an ad for this terraforminator, terraforminator lawnmower. You have to see it to understand it, but nobody else probably could have done this other than Hulk Hogan in his brother voice, pretty much. Oh, uh, God. I, I could go on and on and on, but there's, yeah, there's just so many freaking people in this movie. Again, that is the weirdest. Can, can, would you ever imagine to have had a movie with Hulk Hogan and Dolly Parton and Jason Statham and Maggie Smith. No? It's just weird. 
So I've said that enough, but yeah, it's it makes it fun. Uh, I didn't, I accidentally, well, I did, I did accidentally look at the names in the credits on IMDb before I, as well as I was watching it, and I was like, ah, I wish I would have been surprised by that. And I've ruined it for you now, so we're in this together. Uh, but either way, this is the kind of movie you could probably all watch as a family. It's a rated G. There's nothing creepy or weird. There are some, a little bit of innuendo. There's a little bit of things that only you would get. And you'd have to also be a kind of a pop culture person like me. And uh, maybe just a little bit of a freak to understand some of the deep cut kind of references in this. Even like the... the uh, American Beauty reference with the the pedals and everything else. That's it's a 1999 film, I think, and it's, who's going to get that? Uh, no children, certainly. Um, they think they think the original Star Wars, uh, well, not the original. They think the the prequel Star Wars trilogy is like vintage film, like old people grandpa movies. So yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I actually liked Romeo and Juliet, so give it a shot. I think this is the kind of thing that has a tremendous amount of rewatch re value. Uh, I can't say I'm going to go out of my way to watch it again necessarily, but if I had, if it came on again, I'd watch it, and I think I'd see a whole lot more each time because there's so many little things. One of my favorite things in this are the little stone bunnies that uh, assist Benny, uh, one of the gnomes has to be named after Betty and the Jets. It's just the way it is. Because um, I'm pretty sure the song Benny and the Jets plays at some point during one of his sequences. Oh, and by the way, the animation is good. It's not awesome, but it's good. And it's also done with a little bit of a different frame rate where it seems somewhat choppy in some of the movements of the characters. And that kind of adds some sort of... adds a, a, an additional bit of character to the whole thing. It's it's actually really good. It, it looks nice. It's not constant, but especially with the little characters like the bunnies, which I liked. The way their ears moved and stuff. Watch it, and you'll understand. It's kind of a cool effect. But I'm a nerd about that. Anyway, let's pick tomorrow in this episode. 209. 209? 201 to 209. Well, I don't think scroll far. Yeah. Well, this is uh, not hard to hard to do. It's not one short. It's a series of shorts from a show that I got to love through doing this. And I've been wanting to see it for a while, but I, thankfully this thing here, the Disney Plus Everyday Challenge, got me to finally watch it. And I finished the entire series because it's so freaking good. It is Gravity Falls. We're going to watch the shorts from Gravity Falls, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to watch all of them by tomorrow. I don't care if there's 50 of them. There's probably not 50 of them, but I'm going to watch them. So I'll see you back here tomorrow with the Gravity Falls shorts on the Disney Plus Everyday Challenge.